Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History, Constitution for Dummies, the series. That's right guys, we've done the preamble. Today we're doing Article 1 of the Constitution, and we'll follow up with another six or seven videos, taking you through the Constitution step by step, so you can understand exactly what it says. If anybody's going to talk about politics, you need to understand the rule book, and that would be the Constitution. So whether you're in middle school, high school, college, or you're cray cray on the internet, we're going to do it nice and dandy for you here right now. So uh, I'll do the teaching, you do the learning, ding dong, here it goes. Alright, Article 1 guys, there's 10 sections, so let's take you through each section, starting with section number 1. That deserves a title. Article 1, Section 1. Article 1, Section 1 just simply states that Congress will be made up not of one house, drum roll, two houses, right? This is the Great Compromise, or uh, the Connecticut Compromise, if you're looking for good vocab. But basically what it says is we'll have a House of Representatives, and we're going to have a Senate. So that is Article 1, Section 1. How simple is that? <laughs> Article 1, Section 2, guys, specifically deals with the House of Reps out of that great compromise and some of the attributes that are important to know. Um, number one, I always use the analogy of a mad dog, and you'll find out in a second why I call the House of Reps a mad dog. But number one, it relates to direct democracy. Um, section 2 clearly states that the House of Reps will be directly elected by the people of those states. That direct democracy is the only instance in the original Constitution where the founders trusted ordinary people, white men with land, to elect their representatives. So that's in Section 2, that they are directly elected. And that analogy of the mad dog lends itself to that concept, that a mad dog must be on a leash. In class, we have a prop, we have a leash, and we put DD on the leash, and we attach it to kind of a plush little puppy dog. And that represents the idea that that plush little puppy dog, which is a mad dog, needs to be leashed to the people. That that's a tremendous power that that dog represents in terms of being able to pass laws and take rights away, yada, yada, yada. So we want the people to at least have one hand on a leash so they can yank that uh, part of the government if it's getting out of sorts and it's not representing the will of the people. We also want to make sure that that leash is quite short. You don't want to put a mad dog on a 15-foot leash unless you want a lawsuit. So that concept of a short leash is also in Section 2 that they will serve for two years. So the leash works out really well if you want to understand the concept of direct democracy and the two-year term gig. There's also requirements for being a House of Rep member to be eligible to run. Number one, you have to be 25 years old and you have to be a resident of your state for seven years. So that is what it is. Also in section two, we have the idea of how we're going to calculate the number of reps that each state's going to get. We're going to find out that the Great Compromise created a House of Reps where each state would be represented by the population that their state has. So the larger populated states would get more representatives. And it gets a little bit complicated in terms of the number. 435 was set in 1929. But no matter where, how large we grow, it all depends on the census. Every 10 years we take a census and that census tells us how many people are living in New Jersey and how many people are now living in Minnesota. And then we take that 435 and we allocate those numbers proportionately. So each state gets a number that's representative of the people that live in that state. So also in that section too is that every state has to get one. So for instance, Wyoming has one house representative member even though they probably don't deserve one. They probably deserve like half of one, but they get at least one. Large states like New York and California and Texas have 30, 40, 50 representatives. Now, that state is then given the power to determine those congressional districts and how those lines are drawn, but let's stick to the Constitution. Um, we also had the three-fifths compromise that was part of that section, but that was nullified by the 13th Amendment. For every five slaves that a state had, they would get three people counted in the census, and those three citizens or people were then used to get more representative power. So how terrible is that? Um, we also have the method by which the House of Representatives will choose their speaker. It's called the Speaker of the House, and that would be by vote of themselves. So whatever party is in power generally is going to get to pick the speaker. 
Um, and they also get impeachment power in, the, uh, in Section 2. Impeachment power allocated to the mad dog, which represents the teeth. That's the idea, that the mad dog has those teeth which they can impeach the president and impeach judges. But impeachment power is quite powerful. Doesn't mean you're kicked out of office. It means that you're going to go to the Senate and they're going to be at trial. Then you might get to leave. But it's that idea that they have that power, those sharp teeth. So, Mad Dog's House of Rep members, and remember, only two presidents have ever been impeached. That would be Bill Clinton and, you know, the other one, don't you? I'm not going to tell you. It's Andrew Johnson. All right, let's move on, move on! All right, so Section 3, we'll do 1-3, right? Section 3 of Article 1 specifically deals with the Senate. We just dealt with the House of Reps. So the Senate is very much not treated like a Mad Dog. Um, the Mad Dog concept, as we go back to the House, is kind of the idea that these guys are maybe quick-tempered, that they're dealing with local issues, they're going to be passionate and factionalized. So therefore, we need another body, if the House is cray-cray, that's a little bit more tempered, a little bit more like the wise old men and women on the hill up there. So that idea in the Senate is in a few different attributes. One would be, and this is Section 3, that they're going to serve six years in, in office. And they weren't even leashed. The states were allowed to choose their own senators, and very much that became a power of the uh, elites of the state, picking senators that represented their views, maybe not the views of the people of the state. But the concept was that they would serve for six years, and that six years would give them, you know, kind of waiting time. So if there was kind of an issue, maybe the people were against, but it was in the best interest of the nation, you could vote for it, and you had five years maybe before you had to face the electorate. In fact, the Constitution in Section 3 has them being voted on on a rotation basis. Only one-third of the Senate can be up for election. So every two years, the Senate has one-third transfer rate. And this kind of, you know, tempers the idea that you're going to get like a quick revolutionary concept to kind of flood the country because the Senate is always going to have um, two-thirds that have been there for a little while. So that's another attribute of Section 3. Um, instead of 25, we bump it up to 30. So you got to be 30 years old in order to be a senator. And you have to be a resident of the state that you're running for for nine years um, before you are eligible. Um, also, the Senate, it clearly states in Section 3 that the Vice President of the United States will preside over the Senate, but they only get to vote if there is, in fact, a tie. And there's been some big instances in American history where there's been tiebreakers. Al Gore, I believe, in a, the 93 Clinton budget. But for the most part, they, you know, kind of chill. They don't go to the Senate very much. They're kind of busy doing the other things. But interestingly enough, it's the only part of the government that has one foot in two branches. Um, the executive branch being vice president with the president there, right? And now having one foot in the Senate, at least as uh, kind of the, you know, uh, titular head of the Senate. Um, what else do we want to say? In Section 3, we have the president pro tem position. This is the person who presides over the Senate. It's a voted on position. And later we're going to find out that the Senate pro temp, I believe, is in fourth in line to be president after the Speaker of the House. Um, also, we go to the impeachment concept. The impeachment idea of biting the president is in the House. So the wise old men and women on the Hill are going to have the trial. And that requires a supermajority, two-thirds in order to convict or get rid of a president or a judge. And that is called a supermajority because it's more than half, and it means that it damn well be really important and clear before you all go out doing that and such. That's the idea, that it tempers change. We want you to understand that there's powers in the Constitution, and there's you know some tremendous uh, things that can happen. How about that for, for fancy language? But they're all tempered. They're all slowed down, in a sense, to make sure that we do things um, with consideration and with deliberation. So there you go, let's move on. I'm doing it, I'm moving on. All right, Article 1, Section 4, really short, guys, meetings and elections, basically stating that elections are going to be run by the states and that Congress must meet at least once a year. Move on, Hughes, move on. Yeah.
Article 1, Section 5 is entitled Rules and Procedures. Um, the House and the Senate, respectively, um, ultimately decide the outcome of elections and um, which way it goes. So if there's a lot of controversy, the House and the Senate decide those things. Um, you need half present in order to have what's called a quorum. A quorum means that you're allowed to have a meeting, so half the House members and half the senators have to show up in order to do that. And two-thirds supermajority if they want to expel a member. This is an impeachment. Impeachment deals with the other branches. This is internal business. This is like gang stuff. Yo, we don't like Tommy. What are we going to do? You need two-thirds majority in order to expel that member. And we move on! <laughs> Article 1, Section 6, guys, is going to deal with privileges and restrictions. Number one, their salaries are set by law. So they write laws that give themselves their salary. Um, the trick in the pony is that if they give themselves a raise, according to the 27th Amendment, they don't get that money until they've been reelected. They have to go back to the voters and tell everybody, hey, gave myself a raise, elect me. So there's a little bit of justice there. Um, also, uh, anything that they say or do in Congress, they can't be criminally prosecuted. There's almost like kind of a shield around Congress. And this is a lot to allow them, um, I guess, to you know, do their business the way that they see fit. If they're going to be punished, I guess they're going to be punished by the voters. They also cannot be arrested traveling, according to Section 6, to and from Congress, unless it's a, like a high crime or um, treason or something like that. And they can't have any other government jobs. We don't want them to have one hand in the legislative branch and another hand in the executive branch and then maybe a foot in a judge's robe because of separation of powers. But that's pretty much it. We're getting to the good stuff here, guys. Article 1, Section 7, guys, is going to deal with bills and laws. Number one, the House of Representatives is giving the sole power to start revenue bills, tax bills. And this goes back to that Mad Dog concept, right? How cool are analogies? That the teeth, those sharp teeth used to impeach the president, also can bite you in the ass financially. They can raise your taxes. And the reason they're given the power is because if they do that, what are you going to do to the lease, baby? You're going to yank it. That's the concept, that they are direct democracy with two-year terms, short leash. So they're accountable to the people. So no taxation and without representation? I think not. Now, um, Clause uh, 2 goes to kind of lawmaking, how a bill becomes a law kind of stuff. Basically, both House and Senate must come up with the same bill. There's a lot of stuff that goes into that, and committees and subcommittees and conference committees, joint committees. But at the end of the day, the bill that gets sent to the president was voted on and passed by a simple majority in the House and a simple majority in the Senate. Now that the president has gotten the bill, he actually has three choices. Now, I thought you th thought there was two, right? He can sign the bill, and then everybody has a parade. He can veto the bill, and then it goes back to the House that it originated from. So if the Senate passed it first, it goes back to the Senate. If it was originated in the House, it goes back to the House, and then they can start the override veto procedure. So they can be like, you think you're going to veto my bill? I think not. <laughs> Super majority. So they need two-thirds the second time around in the House and the Senate, but if it's incredibly popular and the president's just spit on it, you can bring that bill back to life. So he can sign it, she can sign it, the president, right? They can veto it, or they can do nothing. And the way this works is, and this is in Section 7, that if they do nothing, after 10 days, it just magically grows into a law. It's a law. So maybe the president kind of supports it, but doesn't want to have a big signing ceremony with cameras and just kind of does nothing. And after 10 days, that sucker becomes a law. But if it's at the end of a congressional term, and this is in Section 7, and let's say there's only eight days left in the term and they pass a law, then after the 10 days, if the president has done nothing, it's called a pocket veto. And then it goes to an automatic veto with him actually not doing it, and the bill would become dead because they wouldn't be able to revive the override to the next, uh, into the next session. So there you go. We're getting there. Number eight's a big one. Article 1, Section 8 is probably the longest part of the Constitution because it's delegated power. It's all the power that the founders, when they wrote the Constitution, decided to give to the legislative branch. And now the language is the language, so you can argue to the cows come home about the meaning of the words. But let's basically go over them right now. So let's scroll it, baby. Turn to the board. What can Congress do? Congress can collect and raise taxes to provide for the common defense and provide for the general welfare. 
Congress can create a national debt. Congress can regulate foreign and Indian commerce. Congress deals with laws of naturalization and immigration. Congress coins cash. Congress deals with counterfeiting. Congress gets to establish and regulate post offices. Congress gets to promote science and important arts with copyright and patent laws. Congress gets to set up courts that are inferior to the Supreme Court, like federal courts. Congress deals with pirates. That's right, my friends, I said piracy. Congress can declare war. Congress gets to raise and support armies. Congress gets to raise and support navies. Congress gets to regulate the armed forces and the Navy. Congress can call up to action the National Guard. Congress gets to organize, arm, and regulate the National Guard, but states provide for training. Congress gets to govern the Capitol. And drum roll, please. Congress gets the Elastic Clause. Congress shall make all laws that are necessary and proper for carrying out those other ones I mentioned, 1 through 17, and all other powers that are in the Constitution. All right, back to Hughes. Bam. So that's a laundry list, guys. 1 through 17, that's all of the delegated power that the Constitution gives Congress. But there's a little kind of asterisk at 18. And that elastic clause and the language, you know, is clear but flexible, states in order to accomplish all of that, Congress gets to decide what's necessary and proper for enacting those laws, as well as all the other power that's vested in the Constitution. So we can argue other days, we can debate other things, but that's the language, baby. Article 1, Section 9 is with limits on the legislative branch, limits on Congress. Number one, there's a limit on their ability to regulate slave trade, believe it or not, up to 1808. Of course, this is all nullified by the 13th Amendment. There's also the habeas corpus clause in Section 9, which states that Congress cannot suspend the writ of habeas corpus. The writ of habeas corpus, really quickly, is if you know your loved one's arrested and you go to the judge, you can demand a writ of habeas corpus. They have to bring the person there and state the charges and, you know... Uh, there's got to be a reason why he's in jail. You're not allowed to suspend that according to Section 9 unless there's an invasion, a rebellion, or public safety um, deems it necessary. So there's even a little asterisk on that limitation. Um, also, no bills of attainer or ex post facto laws. Bills of attainer are laws that are specifically passed to punish individuals. And ex post facto laws means you can't arrest me for smoking a cigarette today if it's illegal tomorrow but it was legal today, ex post facto laws. Also, no direct taxes, unless those taxes are proportional to the population in the state. So like land taxes and things like that need to be um, adjusted according to population. Of course, the 16th Amendment allows for direct taxes on income, but that's for another day and another dollar. Also, uh, Congress may not pass any laws that favor certain harbors or you know different regions of the country. Also, Congress may not spend any money unless there's a law that spends the money. They can't just stick their hand in the cookie jar. They have to actually attach it to some type of law. Um, also, there's going to be no nobility. How about that for an end for Section 9? No uh, uh, congressional laws that make kings and queens and princes. And if you're a member of Congress, you can't go and get knighted in England because that would be a conflict of interest. So those are all the limits on congressional power, the big ones being the habeas corpus with the asterisk. Definitely, if you're in a college course or an AP government course, you want that bill of attainer and ex post facto laws because they love the Latin. I love the Latin ladies. All right, here we go. We're almost done. Get out of here. Article 1, Section 10, just to wrap up, is just kind of a little hand slap on the states to repeat some of the legislative powers that we don't want state powers doing as well. So, for instance, uh, no bills of attainer, no ex post facto laws, no granting nobility and stuff like that for the states. States are not allowed to enter in with treaties with other states or other nations, form alliances, or coin their own money. States are also not allowed to exercise taxes, import and export taxes, on products leaving and coming into their state. And certainly, states cannot declare war. How would you like that? Georgia goes to war against Nicaragua. That would be great for like a betting table. Who would win that one? All right, there you go, guys. I'm done.
But you're not done with Hipview's history because we got about 200 videos, guys. Check them out. We also have links to other great uh, EDU channels that you're going to want to check out by clicking the description below. And certainly, if you haven't subscribed to me, what the hell? What are you doing? Look at him sweating. You got to subscribe, and maybe you could win a pony. So there you go, guys. Where attention goes, energy flows. We'll see you. See you in the locker room.